Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everyone to this uh, exciting educational activity of the uh, IDF MENA region to um, um, be the moderator for tonight's uh, very interesting scientific meeting, which I'm I hope that you will all uh, enjoy it as much as I think that you will do. Uh, tonight, our event is sponsored by uh, Merck Pharma Pharmaceutical. Uh, we're very delighted for the support by Merck for this event, which is named Type 2 Diabetes Early Treatment Debate. So uh, perhaps I would ask my colleagues uh, and Professor uh, uh, Jamal to all um, show their camera and un unmute themselves so that we, we can all see the faculty of tonight. So uh, inshallah, what we have tonight for you is a very interesting topic. We all know that the treatment for type two diabetes is really important. It's important to get it right from the very beginning. So when you think of the initiation of, treat of early treatment, it's important to try to get it right. Tonight, we have a faculty uh, from um, uh, three different countries. And we also have the presence of Professor Jamal Belkhadir, uh, the chairperson of the IDF MENA region. Um, so we have from uh, ladies first, I will start with ladies from, uh, from the MAM Saudi Arabia, my dear uh, friend, Professor Ibtissam Baissa. Uh, Professor Ibtissam is a consultant internist and endocrinologist and the former medical director of the MAM Medical Complex. Uh, she's also assistant professor in uh, of internal medicine at the MAM University. Um, she is a tutor in the, in the Cardiff University uh, for the diploma, and she's a very good friend and a collaborator in a number of studies. She has under her belt a large number of publications um, in the field of diabetes. Um, moving on to the next um, country, uh, in, the, in the geography from, we take it from east to west, Professor Khaled Hadidi, Professor of Internal Medicine and Head of the Diabetes and Endocrine Unit in Benny Swift University. He's also quite an eminent uh, endocrinologist, diabetologist in Egypt, member of many diabetes societies and many boards, and also uh, a co-author in a number of studies. I had the pleasure to work with him on a number of studies, and I'm sure you would enjoy his presentation. And then moving west to Tunisia, uh, we have Dr. Ines Selim, a uh, specialist endocrinologist uh, in Tunisia. Um, and she's also with um, um, lots of research in, in the field of diabetes and endocrinology. And she's got two other uh, graduation, one in nutrition and micronutrients and another one in sexology. So, um, and finally, of course, all of you by now know Professor Jamal Belkader. Um, uh, he's a professor from Rabat University and he's the chairperson for the, the IDF MENA. And indeed, he has a large number of uh, academic and publication research. So let me, after introducing everyone, let me tell you about the theme of tonight. And with, to do this, I would like to share my screen. You can see our speakers and here is their photos and their names. And here is the, the plan for today. Today is not a lecture. Today or tonight is a debate. Each moderator will have seven minutes. Um, uh, sorry, um, I, I will introduce the rationale and the case scenario for you. And I will ask you shortly to do a voting, a poll question. And then every moderator will have 12 minutes of presentation and we will try to keep strict timekeeping. I don't want to say that we will stop the speaker, but they're all very collaborative, cooperative and collaborative with, with this. After the three finish, each one of them will have another three minutes to respond back to the points mentioned by the other colleagues. Um, slides could be used if they wish to use slides again. And then we will have a good half an hour or 40 minutes for all of you to share with you your thoughts and your ideas and you can send your questions and from your questions I will be asking them a lot of questions and then finally we'll have another final poll to see whether your opinion has changed based on the material of the debate. So 
to go to the case. I just want you all to focus on the case and not anything else. I don't want you to think of general issues. I want you to focus as if this is a patient in front of you. A 44 year old male consults you at your clinic. He has insurance, so he's not paying from his own pocket. He's just been diagnosed with diabetes six months ago, following routine checkup at his work. He is otherwise healthy. He has no cardiac problem, renal problems, any other problem. He simply was found to have diabetes six months ago during routine checkup. On lifestyle measures, he's been having difficulties to sustain it. So his latest HB1C is eight. At the time of diagnosis, it was 8.26 months ago. Blood pressure is good. Lipids profile is good. Renal function is good and his BMI is 28. So get ready everyone because you will soon be voting and we would need to get every single vote. We don't know who you are, but we need your opinion. So I want you again to think of this case. A male, 44 years of age, completely healthy, apart from just being diagnosed with diabetes six months ago. Currently, he's not taking any medication. He was advised by his doctor go and change your lifestyle. He tried, but he finds this difficult to sustain. And his HB1C is eight. He does not have any other pathology. Blood pressure is good, lipids are good, renal function is good. Now, the question that the debate is for, and you will soon be asked to poll for that question, whether you will start this patient on metformin, or whether you will start him on one single drug, but not metformin, or whether you would start him on more than one drug. And that will be the debate that we will have later today. Dr. Khaled will debate the metformin, and then followed by that, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Tissam Baissa, lastly, Ines, Dr. Ines Salim first, will tell us about um, starting one single drug, but not necessarily metformin. And finally, Dr. Sam Baessa will defend in her opinion of starting more than one drug, a combination of therapy. So now it is for you to give us your opinion. Please vote now. Okay. So 70% said they will start metformin. Um, Dr. Khaled, the, uh, you're in the lead, but you don't want to lose territory. Ines Salim has a very small number of people voted for her. 10 people voted for her, um, 4%. Uh, Dr. Tissam, you're still behind, way behind, but it's not about winning, it's about gaining from the others. So let's see at the end of the presentation of the debate on whether the voting still will be there. Um, I will write that. Uh, and we'll write with the percentage because obviously numbers are not the issue. We now have 280 persons who voted. Okay, so moving on again, here are our debaters and we'll start with the first debate. So I will start, stop sharing my slides. Um, and we now hand over to Dr. Um, uh, to Professor Khaled Hadidi. Again, he's a professor of uh, endocrinology and internal medicine and the head of the crime unit in Beni Suif University. Khalid, the time is yours and the clock starts ticking now. Unmute yourself, please, Khalid. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Khadir. Um, glad to be in here. Because of lack of time, uh, I will go directly to convince my audience about uh, metformin to be used very early. IDF put us in a dilemma. We have a lot of patients. We had a lot of pre-diabetes. Uh, we have a lot of our uh, poor patients are main in middle and low socioeconomic countries. So we are dealing with a big cost on our patients. Metformin history go up and down, go up in the United States uh, with the Finformin tragedy and then go up again, going very markedly after 
اكثر زي دي اس ستادي زي يو دي اس ستادي ميك ذا موف فور ميت فور مي اوف كورس ذا ميكانيزم اي ويل نوت جو ثرو اي جاست بوت ات تو ريمبر ذات ات ورك اون ذا ريزيستنس ورك اون ذا ليفر سام سام ليتل ورك اون ذا انتستين سو اتس ا سيمبل دراج فانكشننج ا فيري بيج ايفنت ذا ميت فور مين از ذير The metformin in WHO, the minimal list in the whole world, WHO puts the metformin to be one of our ideal drug to be put or prescribed ever. Drug that makes some metallic taste, um, some GIT abnormality, sometimes uh, vitamin uh, B at uh, deficiency when you are long users. We never see lactic acidosis with it like fenformin before. Even the contraindication, it's 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 a marvelous drug. Uh, only the advanced um, liver, advanced cardiac, advanced the septicemic, something like that are contraindication. Even the kidney function, we can use it till EGFR thirteen between between thirty and forty five. We can use it uh, a half uh, the usual dose. So it's a safe drug. Usually have a nice uh, action also. Many of them are not approved yet, but still they have a multiple drug. I think the future will make them it for me more and more and more functioning. The UKBDS, a good study in the history, 66,000 patients, all of them are naive, like our, our event today. 66,000, some group of them won on mood for me. What, what, what happened for, the, for them? In the first 10 years in the real study, we have a definite A1C and microvascular outcome uh, good result. In the 10 post-trial follow-up also, we still have the microvascular and have a uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, event. This is, this is what happened. Here in, here in the first study, the any diabetes related endpoint 12% reduction continued to 9%. The microvascular 25 con continued to 24. The myocardial event, the myocardial infarction, even the all cause mortality, the metformin is not an easy drug. It helped us also in cardiovascular. This is um, UKBDS among many studies that show that this molecule is not just only diabetes. It have a, a lot of work up on our cardiovascular patients. Go back to the diabetes prevention program. The diabetes prevention program, as we all know, it about 3,000 uh, population uh, classified to group use placebo, group use metformin uh, um, 850 twice daily, and group on a good lifestyle uh, modification. What we have got? We have got 30 something reduction uh, of metformin and 60, of course, for the lifestyle. So this drug is not easy. This drug can prevent diabetes. This drug can return your diabetes to be in remission zone. Metformin in pre-diabetes and in early stage of diabetes must be number one and may be the only one till, uh, until drugs also come prove that, uh, that uh, idea. On all ESD and the ADA guidelines since 2012 to, uh, till 17, metformin monotherapy, why? Because it's efficacy drug, low risk for hypoglycemia, even neutral weight, maybe some weight reduction, side effects, as we mentioned, nil, cost nil, until we have uh, Nissen and what happened with uh, era of mass cardiovascular outcome study to be done in our era. All the drug coming in the market must have a, a lot of survey on cardiovascular outcome study, sodium glucose transporter, GLP-1, all the, all the coming drug are, uh, must be applied on a cardiovascular disease patients to have uh, an FDA approval and the EMA approval. Of course, of course, it is accepted, but our today's is patient uh, naive, uh, new diabetes, uh, lifestyle modification only um, is not correct. From day one, um, you must start metformin with the lifestyle modification. Uh, even in the pre-diabetes, you can select the metformin. When we go to the um, European Society of Cardiology and uh, make uh, the comparison between, 2000, between 2013 and 19, the metformin first uh, considered as a first line uh, therapy uh, with diabetes. Later on uh, in 19, they put this statement, metformin should be considered in overweight 
patient with type 2 diabetes without cardiovascular and at a moderate cardiovascular risk. This is our debate. This is the line of our debate. It's solved. It's done in 2019. It's, uh, it's solved. Metformin should be the first line in our patients. The American colleague of endocrinology, one of the eminent societies that work on a study, today putting metformin, as you see, metformin hot on the rank, metformin number one, monotherapy in our patient with A1C below 7.5 metformin, then come many of us. Monotherapy, the green light means I had a hell of evidence that prove our uh, talk. When you have a green light, this means that you have an extensive result on this molecule. Of course, we are, are respecting our sodium glucose transporter and GLP-1 and all other drugs, all are available to our patients. But when we are saying a new patients, naive patients, type two diabetic patients, just starting diabetes without cardiovascular event, you must put metformin on the big list. Of course, if we have A1C more than that, uh, we can select metformin plus. Metformin plus, of, of course, we respect the verified study and many studies, they put the dual therapy from the start from, from some patients. But this is a small study. We need a large study that um, proves that, a head-to-head -head study that prove any other molecule can start with uh, metformin or without metformin. What about a few hours ago? few hours ago, just released the diabetes standard of medical care in 2021. It just released a few hours ago. What we have noticed? We had noticed that the first line therapy, again, the next year, we are speaking about the first line therapy is made for me and comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity is still on the top of the left. When you see on the left um, side of, uh, of my wall, you find that this is the new changes, what happened. What happened when you have cardiovascular kidney or atherosclerotic, you, you will put three, uh, three columns. Uh, last year, it was just two columns. And they um, uh, categorize the patient according to if they ha have high risk for atherosclerotic. So you are choosing between GLP or SGLT. When you have heart failure, put now SGLT alone. When you have kidney disease, they put SGLT and then after it, they put the uh, GLP one. And the rest of the paragraph is still kept there. Kept there. The cost, the cost is, is very important. Now we are speaking about drug that will help us for a long time. Of course, our patient not in this group. Uh, most of our patient not atherosclerotic or kidney disease, of course, they are very important. Uh, most of the study done in the last uh, few years was in this group only. Most of the study done in this group, we are categorized because the heart failure, because the atherosclerotic, the cardiac mortality is still the big list number one of our diabetic patients. But still, we must start. We cannot drive the car directly in the third speed. When you ride a car, go to the first one and then go directly to the second and third step speed. We are not against any drug. All of them are marvelous. All of them are used when they are needed to be used. What about our patient, type 2 diabetic patients, which newly or uncontrolled, most of them are lying in 80% in this group, group which are not all of them atherosclerotic or cardiovascular disease or kidney disease. Most of them, most of our patients coming to our clinic, to our units in diabetes, most of them are naive. Most of them are free of any cardiovascular risk. Most of them are available to have a start gradually drug that make them attached to the medications, make them happy, not cost, start by small dose and go up in few weeks to the maximum dose 2000 um, milligram metformin will make your patients happy. Even the metformin failure, which happened after three to four years will make your patients happy because it prevents the uh, progression of diabetes. You can add 
uh, uh, any other drug or combination of drug later on, if you find that A1C target is not reached, if you have any more risk factor appear, still I insist that uh, metformin is the top of the list we must start with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khaled, and thanks for keeping the timing, perfect timing. Well done, thank you. So we now move on. Dr. Khaled has uh, started with 70% and he made us all aware of the benefits and the guidelines of metformin. Now the second uh, debater has a, has a difficult task. Dr. Ines Selim from Tunis, who's a, a specialist in endocrinology, um, has a difficult task because uh, only 10% of the attendees at the time of the voting uh, could believe that uh, we can start another monotherapy. So, uh, Dr. Ines, please unmute yourself and start your presentation. Um, you cannot lose. You already are the third, yeah. so you can only get... <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm aware that I have the most difficult task. So uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best uh, to, uh, to gain more um, uh, votes. Uh, I, 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 I hope I'll be able to give you uh, impactful uh, and convincing uh, arguments uh, to uh, gain the debate. Uh, so I will be closer to the case uh, presented uh, more uh, than Dr. Khaled. So I, uh, just to uh, remember you that in 1995, uh, like the first uh, mobile um, and the only one uh, which was, uh, which existed at that time, we have also met for me as almost the, the only uh, therapy. But now we are uh, in 2020, so we have more choices in mobile phones, but also in treatment of diabetes, we have a lot of choices, a lot of medication in insulin or oral therapy. So we, we can uh, profit from this. So is it possible to choose uh, to choose other therapy than metformin in, um, in first line uh, therapy? I know that in, um, when uh, we uh, see guidelines, uh, all guidelines are um, uh, defending uh, metformin, uh, EAD, ESG, MENA region guidelines uh, in uh, India, also in French and the European Society of Cardiology. This is uh, something that we know, uh, but also all, uh, uh, virtually all recommendation uh, for any cell pharmacological therapy outside of China, because you know China uh, is uh, defending uh, alpha glucosidol uh, inhibitors uh, because they uh, use it frequently. All these recommendations endorse uh, uh, the use of metformin. Uh, there are, in fact, relatively few relevant direct comparative effectiveness which are available head-to-head -head, uh, comparison. So there are arguments, although all of this, there are arguments to support first-line therapy other than metformin. First of all, you know that in patients who have, who have contraindication or intolerance for metformin, we are obliged to uh, choose an alternative glucose-lowering medication. Um, almost 5% of patients uh, may uh, have intolerance. So we can choose a, uh, anything else or uh, uh, something other than metformin, and we can uh, uh, have a successful therapy with those patients. So it is possible to use other things. In UKPDS, you know, in newly diagnosed uh, patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, it it was shown that uh, when we uh, do intensive therapy, we are uh, able to uh, decrease uh, uh, almost 25% uh, the development of microvascular disease. Uh, so uh, when we start with something which is uh, more um, uh, effective than uh, metformin, we can have also a benef uh, benefit, uh, benefits on uh, macrovascular endpoints. The third point is uh, the topic of individualized medicine. You know, uh, this is something which is um, defended by ADA and the ASD since uh, 2006. And uh, those guidelines emphasize the importance of individualizing the choice of medication and uh, we, should, we should consider 
for each patient, patient uh, sorry, comorbidities and patient specific uh, factors, including patient preference, values, and scopes. So if we can use something else other than uh, metformin, which classes we can uh, use? Uh, for our patient, uh, he has no uh, hypoglycemia risk. He is newly diagnosed with diabetes. His age is 44. He is overweight, so he has no other uh, important com comorbidities, uh, no uh, vascular complication. We have no idea about his preference, uh, about uh, choice of uh, medication, and we have, uh, we have no idea also uh, on his um, resources. So we can be uh, more stringent in um, uh, targets, in glycemic targets, and we can choose uh, A1C um, below uh, 7 points, even 6.5. So if we see a different um, expected decrease in A1C uh, uh, among uh, different therapies, uh, metformin can do uh, um, uh, to two point decrease of A1C, but we can do it the same with other medication like sulfonylureas, like uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, like glymid. You know, so we we can uh, use other medication to achieve the same uh, A1C uh, target. If we will uh, choose insulin, for example, we have no uh, dose limit. We can uh, decrease A1C uh, until three points. Uh, it is rapidly effective. It can improve uh, lipid profile. Uh, in uh, guidelines. It, be, it may be the first um, line th uh, therapy if A1C is uh, above 9%, but it is not the case of our patients. The, the problem with insulin as a first line uh, therapy is uh, the number of injections is that requiring monitoring, uh, it may um, result in weight gain, hypoglycemia. So it could be not a good uh, alternative to metformin for this patient. If we see sulfonylureas, it can be a choice uh, because it has a glucose lowering efficacy, good uh, efficacy, rapidly effective, universal av uh, availability, and low cost. But it can induce hypoglycemia and weight gain, which is not uh, something uh, um, uh, that we uh, want to do with this patient. But we can choose shorter acting agents, uh, which may be preferred in this case. For glenid as a first line therapy, it is rapidly effective, but it can also uh, result on, in a weight gain. And we should take it three times a day do, uh, dosing, and it may be induced also hypoglycemia. For tiazolinzion, in, in Tunisia, we uh, don't have any more this, um, this uh, medication. Although it is a good option when uh, we have a metabolic syndrome, it can improve uh, lipid profile, uh, potential to decrease in uh, MI, but there are a lot, a lot of uh, side effects with this uh, class of uh, therapy. GLP-1 receptor uh, agonist, uh, it is a good option when we are uh, thinking about weight loss, which is something good for uh, this uh, patient as he has a, um, an overweight. So uh, we can also uh, have a reduction in major adverse uh, cardiovascular events, but we require in this case injection, which can be refused by the, the patient and it may decrease the adherence to treatment. Uh, we have frequent uh, gastrointestinal side effects and it is expensive, a very expensive therapy. Uh, SGLT2 um, inhibitor may be also a good uh, option because it will help us for weight uh, loss. It is an oral agent uh, that may be uh, uh, prescribed once daily. It will uh, help for reduction in systolic blood pressure, cardiovascular mortality, and it can also improve renal outcomes in patients with nephropathy but it may have also other uh, side uh, effects and uh, long-term safety is not very, very established until now. DPP-4 inhibitor as a first-line therapy, it's not a bad uh, also option uh, as it has, it has uh, um, weight, uh, it is weight neutral. So uh, we can avoid um, weight gain uh, with our patient. It uh, may be uh, prescribed once or twice daily. It is an oral agent, don't, 
so it's a, a simple uh, use uh, but we have the possible uh, so um, uh, increase of uh, heart failure with uh, sexagliptin uh, and it may be expensive in some um, in some um, countries so Alpha glucose, uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitor are also a good option because they are weight neutral. Uh, but we have uh, with uh, this class frequent uh, gastrointestinal side effects, and we should use it three times a day uh, dosing. Plamram teed is not uh, available in uh, every country. We don't have it in uh, Tunisia, but it may um, help in weight uh, loss. So uh, to finish, in practice, based all, uh, on all the, these data, what are option, uh, options other than metformin for this uh, patient? Based on A1C, which is 8% for this patient, options are, we'll not uh, choose insulin uh, in this case, but GLP-1 receptor agonists, sulfonylureas, SGLT2 inhibitors, DPP-4 inhibitors, repaglinid, and alpha glucosidase inhibitors may be uh, good options other than metformin for this question. When we are based on um, weight, uh, his BMI is uh, 28. Uh, we will remain only, uh, uh, we will keep in the list GLP-1 receptor agonists. For sulfonylurea, only shorter acting agents are preferred like limepiride, SGLT2 inhibitors also may be used, DPP4 inhibitors, and alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. For weight loss, as a priority for this patient, or at least to avoid weight gain, we can uh, use only uh, short-acting agents uh, in uh, of sulfonylurea, DPP4 inhibitors, and alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. So when we, we use uh, sulfonylureas, uh, when uh, we will take uh, um, to account uh, cost, uh, we should associate initial lifestyle intervention and uh, diabetes self-management education to uh, minimize uh, side effects of this uh, class. Finally, based on risk of uh, hypoglycemia, because we don't uh, have any idea about the job, the work of this patient, perhaps he has a dangerous work or how to work, so we should avoid hypoglycemia. We can use, in this case, DPP-4 inhibitors, or uh, if we have also a problem of cost, we will uh, use alpha-glucosidase inhibitor. So, all the metformin remains the first line uh, monotherapy in most of um, uh, in most of uh, patients with uh, type 2 diabetes. Always remember that there are various pharmacological options to treat. Keep in mind the importance of individualized targets and therapeutic regimen. Consider comorbidi comorbidities and patient-specific factors, and be aware that patients with newly diagnosed diabetes should uh, have a comprehensive diabetes self-management education program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ines. Very clear. Um, and thanks for, also for keeping your time. Um, so what we found is that other options are there. There was not much um, recommendations from the guidelines to say this, but you've defended the case of the pros and cons of the therapy that might be suitable for this case. So now we have uh, uh, my very good friend, uh, Dr. Ibtissam Baessa, I've introduced earlier, but pleasure to introduce Ibtissam again. Um, uh, the clock didn't start yet, Ibtissam. Um, uh, so you now try to defend starting the combination therapy. Go ahead, Ibtissam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I will continue the debate supporting early combination therapy for newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, and I hope I will be able to convince you that this is the best treatment for your patient. And I will start with uh, my disclosure of relationship. And actually, this slide summarizes everything I want to say in my talk. So I will start with limitation of uh, uh, reactive stepwise treatment, whether it's metformin or other drug, with my due respect to Prof. Khalid and Prof. Inas. Actually, we know that most patients of type 2 diabetes 
diabetes will eventually require combination drug therapy. And also this may lead uh, in the delay of the initiation of additional antihyperglycemic medication. This is clinical inertia and potential to accelerate disease progression and beta cell failure, and also delay in achieving glycemic goal and longer exposure to hyperglycemia, which may result to developing complication and increasing the risk for drug side effect when trying to maximize the dose resulting in an adherence to treatment. However, the rationale uh, of what I'm supporting for initial early combination, we know that early combination is superior, uh, results in earlier and durable glycemic control. Long-term consequences of metabolic memory may improve function and potentially to delay disease progression and preserve the beta cell function. It avoids clinical inertia and reduce time to initiation of second drug and delays treatment escalation and time to treatment failure. Delay time before insulin is initiated also target multiple pathophysiological defect with complementary mode of actions and exert additional beneficial effect on cardiovascular, renal, and also premature mortality, promote weight loss, and reduce hypoglycemia. In addition, potential reduction of side effect of drugs at lower doses, and also is considered less complex than late intervention. So with my due respect, whether you start with metformin or other drug option, this is not the best option for your patient. And uh, early combination remains the best option for your patient, and I'm going to give you the evidence. And initial early combination includes either dual therapy with metformin and another uh, oral glucose lowering drug or two oral uh, glucose lowering drug if patient is intolerant to metformin or triple therapy with metformin plus two uh, oral glucose lowering drug or one uh, or two oral drugs uh, with uh, an injectable, whether this is insulin or non-insulin drug. So I know the first question I'm going to be faced with is the cost. This is a costly treatment. However, I will tell you this is a cost-effective measure. The cost of benefit of early glycemic control outweigh the cost of treating any of the complications that the patient may develop with poor control. So what is the evidence for early combination? I'll just start with the drawback of stepwise treatment. We know that stepwise treatment patient will remain, uh, will have periods of hyperglycemia, and we know that even a short period of hyperglycemia increases the risk for complications. Also, what we learned from the UKBDS trial, that monotherapy does not provide long-term stable glycemic control and requiring additional and, uh, combination uh, of glucose-lowering agent. So stepwise lacks durability and also loses the glucose uh, or the legacy effect. Also, we, have, we know that whether you start with the monotherapy with insulin, sulfonylurea, or metformin, people achieving A1C target of less than 7% at three years or six or nine years is really low, below 50%. And as the time goes, this uh, uh, people achieving target becomes lower. So stepwise uh, results in suboptimal control and delay in achieving goals. Also, sometimes you need to titrate the uh, uh, medication uh, to maximum in order to achieve a better outcome. However, we know, I will give an example here of metformin. If you try to increase the dose from 2 grams to 2.5 grams, the benefit on glycemic control is really not uh, that much. And in addition, with that increase, you will get more side effect, and this will result in discontinuation of treatment and non-adherence to treatment. Also, clinical inertia in this study have shown that if patient was started on monotherapy with their metformin or sulfonylurea, it takes more than one year in order to step up the treatment to add another treatment. So this is clinical inertia. So what is the evidence now for early combination with dual therapy? This is two studies showed, uh, the first one is uh, showing the benefit of adding glupiride, uh, sulfonylurea to metformin, and the other one, the benefit of adding TZDs to submaximal sulfonylurea. And both studies have shown that early combination, the, the number of patients achieved A1C target of less than 7% is much higher than if the, each drug used uh, separately or alone. And also in this study, looking at DDB4 inhibitor linagliptin added to metformin at uh, uh, adequate dose, it has shown that it will result in significant A1C reduction as compared to adding it to a lower dose of metformin or to each drug alone. So again, early combination results in better glycemic control. In this study, they looked at the class of SGL2 inhibitor, uh, embagliflozone added to metformin at variable doses, as you can see here. And here it showed that even at lowest dose of embagliflozone added to metformin, 500 milligram twice daily, resulted in significant A1C reduction and comparable to uh, all other uh, doses and even better than each drug used uh, alone at its maximum dose. So again, results in better glycemic control. 
And also, this is an uh, analysis, meta-analysis of 15 randomized control trial looked at combination therapy of metformin with uh, many of the uh, agents that we have now, TZD, sulfonylurea, glenide, DDB4 inhibitor, EGL2 inhibitor, in people who are drug naive or early uh, diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And all those studies have proved that the early combination will result in significant A1C reduction at a lower risk for complications, particularly hypoglycemia. So in this study, the, the COSMIC study, it's not only the uh, effect on A1C reduction, but they looked at the combination of uh, cetagliptin to metformin, and it have shown that the effect is also durable up to four years of, uh, after uh, initiation of treatment. This is one of the latest trials called Verified Trial, looked again at early combination of vildagliptin uh, to uh, metformin in newly diagnosed type to diabetes, looking for durability up to five years. And what they found, that they found that early combination will result in prolongation of the time uh, in glucose control, which is nearly doubled, and also extend the uh, time before um, uh, in the glycemic control. And also it will result in prolongation and reduction of the time to secondary treatment failure, which is significantly, uh, statistically significant, up to 26%, and also results in delay in the need of insulin therapy. So this suggests the legacy effect and also attenuation of the diabetes progression. So this is one of the studies that confirmed superiority and long-term glycemic durability and tolerability of early combination in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes with delaying in the time of treatment failure. So now what is the evidence for triple therapy? So this is again one of the studies that looked at people who are newly diagnosed and they compared or randomized people to either start with metformin, bioglitazone, and GLB-1 receptor agonist exenatide as compared to metformin followed by sequential addition of sulfonylurea or insulin glargin. And what they found, they found that early combination of triple therapy resulted in better A1C reduction and also delayed the time of, to failure uh, of treatment and that was significant, statistically significant and again at a lower risk for hypoglycemia and weight gain. So again, early combination, better glucose control, more durable, delayed time to treatment failure, and also reduce the risk of drug adverse reaction. Again, this is one of the latest trials that was published this year. Again, looking at triple therapy with DDB4 inhibitor, TZD, and metformin in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes as compared to sequential. And they found that with triple therapy, more people attain A1C target of uh, less than uh, 7% and also with reduced risk for hypoglycemia and with lower uh, percentage of risk therapy, or uh, this also an indirect indication of restoration of beta cell and with durability of the glycemic control. So again, better control, more durable, delay disease progression, and also reduce drug side effect at lower doses. So what is the ideal com uh, components of combination therapy? Uh, uh, simply speaking, uh, any drugs with complementary mechanism of action. And luckily, we have now different classes of drug that works at different pathophysiology. So you can combine any of them except combining GLB-1 receptor agonists with DDB4 inhibitor because they belong all to the same incretin class. However, the best combination would be metformin with DDB4 inhibitor or SGL2 inhibitor or the three of them based on their lowest risk for hypoglycemia. I would uh, support uh, Professor Khalid for metformin, not only because of uh, its um, uh, glycemic effect, but also for additional effects. So I think any patients with type 2 diabetes should be on this drug if there is no contraindication. So the choice after metformin, after excluding cardiovascular disease and renal problem, it will depend on the risk of hypoglycemia weight and also the degree of hyperglycemia to decide whether to start with dual or triple therapy. In addition, you should always keep in mind people, pl uh, females planning pregnancy. And if you have concern about compliance, we have fixed ratio treatment. And this is a suggested initial combination therapy, whether you start with dual oral or triple oral, or you start with dual or triple oral and injectable. And if you are concerned about compliance because of polypharmacies, then we have fixed ratio combination either for oral or for injectable with basal insulin and GLB-1 receptor agonist. And this is the uh, approved coformillary product of fixed ratio. So what is the current guideline says? Again, it says that if you have a patient with A1C above 7.5, so then you may start with dual therapy or triple therapy in addition to metformin to aim A1C of 6.5%. Uh, and this is also supported by the ADA, the latest ADA, 
early combination to extend the time to treatment failure, particularly if the A1C is equal to or more than 1.5% above the glycemic target. So you should start with dual therapy. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the, national for, uh, the rationale for early combination treatment in adults with new type 2 diabetes is straightforward and study clearly supported the, this glycemic benefit, as I have shown you. It will lead to a greater durable A1C reduction, delayed disease progression, and preserve beta cell, delay time to treatment failure, avoid clinical inertia, reduce time spent in hyperglycemia, prevent chronic complication, and also reduces drug adverse reaction at sub-maximal doses. And, the, uh, and this is opposed to the to the uh, wait and see approach with stepwise treatment that will result in loss of control, clinical inertia, progression of the disease, and suboptimal delayed glycemic control, more time spent in hyperglycemia, more complications, and more complex regimen. So as first-line therapy, not metformin alone, and not other options alone, but combination therapy with two or three drugs. And I'll just go refer to our patients in the last slide here. Our patients is newly diagnosed type two diabetes. His A1C is above eight. We have to remember that it is above eight. It's not 7.5 and he's overweight with normal renal function. So the best option for this patient, I would say starting with early combination therapy and I would aim or target A1C of 6.5 or less if we can achieve that with drugs that have low risk for hypoglycemia. And I would start with metformin. If uh, we, may, we may use XR for better compliance, 1.5 uh, gram added to SGL2 inhibitor uh, to get the benefit of weight reduction in this overweight patients. And we may argue whether we need to add a third drug here like DDB4 inhibitor. So with that, uh, we will have uh, given the patient the best option based on evidence and based on guidelines and recommendation. And I hope I have given you a convincing evidence and that this is the right choice for your patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Bissem, and thanks also for keeping to time. So <laughs> we now have heard <clears throat> the three debaters. Each has explained their case. You, as audience initially, you have voted for 70% for metformin, 4% for something different than metformin, but as monotherapy. And there was 28% for uh, starting a combination therapy, which in a way, what Dr. Pisan is saying, also would be 20, um, based on metformin. So Dr. Khaled, you take the first step again. You have three minutes mm. to respond to the points mentioned by Ines and it is him. Uh, and the clock starts now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank both my colleagues because um, they, they have elegant uh, uh, lectures. Uh, and I think um, all we are succeed today, uh, not the debate. Uh, Dr. Sam and Dr. Ines uh, put a full of, uh, I agree of all of what they said. All of, of, all of what they said are correct. And I mentioned in my lecture that uh, verify study is a promising, but still the number in the studies of combination therapy is little. Um, we have uh, a big tragedy of um, patients all over the world. We have in practice, what happened in practice? In practice, we met a million of patients, especially in the low socioeconomic country. I know uh, some of the MENA region uh, are well-to-do countries, but, uh, but the most of our uh, MENA region are uh, in the low or um, moderate socioeconomic countries. Uh, of course, uh, all the data come, come with uh, metformin. All the data meets the metformin first. That make my mission uh, very easy. Uh, Dr. Ines uh, put uh, in her um, take-home message that metformin is still the first line of therapy. I, I thank her very much because this is uh, uh, honest what, have, what have we found. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Sam said about uh, the uh, combination therapy work in many pathogenesis. Of course, we agree on many pathogenesis, but we are speaking about to start of drug. We start of drugs that make 1% to 2% reduction of A1C. This drug is marvelous, very easy, cost, upgrade. It, it helps the pathogenesis also. We are not against adding any drug even after two months or after three months. You can add whatever you want, but start please with metformin. 
let your patients uh, announce that the diabetes is easy gain, not costly on his pocket. Please start with metformin. As metformin, make him um, training, education programs, and exercise as well, and start an easy drug. Go up with small dose, and then build up till you reach two grams, and then not see your patient. After three months, if the target of A1C not reach, as we mentioned, you add another drug, it's easy again. But when we start, for the most of our patients, which are negative cardiovascular, negative cardiovascular risk with, A1, with A1C above uh, eight even or 7.5, you start with metformin and then go again to add or uh, omit, or if the patient cannot tolerate the metformin, for example. Of course, I agree of all what they said to all my colleagues, uh, but still I'm insist the metformin is the best choice of our patient for this patient, we tailor our drugs to our patient. The patient who I mentioned, this is the tailor for him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid, and thanks for sticking to time. I'm keeping my stopwatch. So now, um, Dr. Khalid was very complimentary to you guys. Ines, he is uh, saying that you are very generous and you also say metformin is the first drug. So defend your case, responding to both Ibtissam and Khalid, by why it's not necessarily to start metformin and why it should not be two drugs. It should be only one drug and of your choice. For the particular case, I again ask you all to focus on the case and not to generalize. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all the this lecture, very interesting lectures. Um, I know that my task is difficult because if I uh, would be the doctor of this patient, I will uh, put him uh, either on metformin or on a combination. So I should uh, defend other option, but it is possible. My, uh, my, um, what I will defend is, it, is um, the, the possibilities we have to offer to our patients. Uh, Dr. Hart say, uh, said that we are in, uh, uh, living in a uh, country with difficult um, economic uh, situation, but we are treating patients, not countries. So sometimes we will uh, give the patient uh, um, a cost effective uh, therapy not based on economy of the, uh, the country. You know, if you can, if you can offer him, uh, for example, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, why not to give him this? It will be good for uh, weight or even um, GLP-1 analogs. It will be uh, something which will be more effective on weight than uh, metformin. But the, the only limit is uh, the, expensive, uh, the, um, the expensive point. A combination could be uh, also uh, an option, but it will um, also uh, have a, a limit of uh, uh, cost like uh, uh, monotherapy with um, uh, an, um, GLP-1 analog receptors or SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. So we can say that this uh, answer is the, uh, the, uh, the um, correct one or the other. We should um, discuss with our patients. We, we should have an idea on his uh, resources. And we have other options than metformin to offer to this patient, not only metformin. I know if we are based on guidelines, it's the, the, this uh, answer. But when we are in real time practice, we can discuss with our, uh, our patient other options that can, we, can be uh, also effective and have um, good results on uh, weight and uh, A, um, A1C also. That's all. Thank you very much, Ines. Yeah. Um, so you've try to respond by saying that um, it is still possible that other drugs can have a role uh, and, 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 and so on. Now, Ibtisam, you were clear in your mind that uh, you've shown us lots of studies and lots of evidence. I want you to focus on our case, please, of this particular patient. Respond back to Khaled and Ines and convince the audience again on your rationale for this particular case of using um, combination of dual or even triple therapy, as you said, 
what will be your plan here in counter the argument of Khaled and um, Ines? Please go ahead. I would first uh, start our patient actually A1C is above a percent and we all agreed and Dr. Inas also have elaborated on this that A1C target in this patient who is early diagnosed with no complications should be tighter. If it is 6.5 or even lower then that would be better. So we are aiming for A1C uh, target decline of more than 1.5 percent. And Dr. Inas have elaborated on the cost and also I've mentioned this early on because I knew that this is going to be addressed. I, the cost of uh, uh, combination therapy, if you weigh the cost and benefit as compared to the cost of treating complication, I would say this is more cost effective to start with early combination. Uh, uh, and the most important thing also Dr. Inas have elaborated on is discussing with the patient. If I discuss with my patient and he agreed to start with early combination, then that should be okay, uh, explaining the uh, evidence. I have shown you the evidence. I think we have enough evidence for uh, dual therapy and triple therapy, and also the guidelines. The guidelines have showed us and told us clearly if the A1C is above 7.5%, this is in the ACE, and if your target decline uh, in the ADA is more than 1.5%, then you should use dual therapy. Now we can argue whether to use dual therapy or triple therapy. Again, I said uh, metformin should always be there in the background for its benefit, uh, as Dr. Khalid mentioned, unless the patient is intolerant or has contraindication. And then after metformin, the choice will depend on the other risk factor, the weight and hypoglycemia, and also importantly on the, uh, 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 the glycemic control. If the A1C is high, if it is like uh, eight to nine, then probably dual uh, therapy will do. But if it is above nine, then probably triple therapy. And if it is more than 10, probably triple therapy that includes insulin therapy in this triple therapy combination. So uh, I think I have shown you enough evidence. I'm convinced. And this is what I'm going to do in real practice with my patient. The patient is overweight. A1C is above eight. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to be the devil advocates. I will forget that you are my friends and I will be the, the nasty person. So I'll start with the last. So Khaled had the choice first to the uh, first couple of times. I will start with you, Ibtissam. If the evidence is so strong, why is the majority of the guidelines are not saying this for the particular case? Our case HB1C is eight. Your target is 6.5. The potential for metformin on its own to go to 6.5 is there. Why do you advocate two drugs and possibly even three? And Actually, if it's so strong, why has ADA, IDF, only ACE guidelines, and the, the evidence of the ACE guidelines is pretty weak? Why do you think the others have not done this? Actually, clearly, the ADA, including the latest 2021 guidelines, it has clearly stated that early dual therapy is, uh, maybe I can show it if I can share this slide again, it is helpful to delay secondary drug failure. And also they have mentioned if the target is declined is more than 1.5, then you should initiate treatment with dual therapy. This is in the ADA recommendation. You can, you can review it and it is there in the ADA recommendations. And, uh, uh, and we have had enough evidence showing that monotherapy, we will have how many patients are really achieving target A1C of uh, below 7%. Still, we did not achieve people, uh, uh, reach people achieving A1C below 7% more than 50%. So I have shown you the evidence that combination may also lead to better A1C reduction. So this is what I can say. As the guidelines say that and the, and the evidence show that. Thank you, Ines. By the way, for all the attendees, please keep sending your questions. I have read your questions and I will try to pass them on to our speakers in one way or the other. But going back to our speakers, Ines, you have dismissed metformin, a drug that is there for 50, over 50 years to start with. And you propose expensive drugs. Now, aren't you concerned? You're a nutritionist as well. Aren't you concerned that that take away the behavior change of the person and will exhaust the budget of the individual or of the organization. If I were to start with a DP4 inhibitor, that's triple the cost. If I start with an SGL2, five times the cost. 
And if I start with a GLP-1, it is 10 times the cost. Aren't you concerned about these two factors? One, you are sort of spoiling the patient. I will give you something that will make you lose weight. Don't do anything, I will do it for you. And second, this is on a very expensive cost. Can the majority of your patients in your country afford this? No, not the majority, but here we are discussing one case. And I uh, want to defend that we have the, the, the opportunity to choose with, um, uh, to choose uh, among um, uh, uh, a big list of, uh, of treatment we have available now. So uh, I, I know that guidelines are um, very strong and they defend um, metformin, but guidelines are uh, here to guide us, to help us. But when we are in real life uh, practice, we have the possibility to, uh, to choose for our uh, patient a specific treatment which, which may be the better for him, the best treatment for him, even if it is expensive, but it will uh, give him an additional um, benefits. Uh, it, we, may, we, we are able to choose this, even if it is not mentioned in the guidelines. And we can have also good results, uh, like we can, like uh, the the cases when uh, we have um, uh, intolerance or contraindication with metformin. We use other medication, and we are able to achieve uh, our targets with without any problem. So we can um, uh, we can use other medication and uh, attend our our uh, targets and uh, also have additional benefits with other uh, treatment options. This is my point of view. Thank you very much, Ines. Khaled, you're my friend, but my, but my friend, I think you got to this, putting um, the full confidence, everybody agrees with me, easy job. Now you've got a, a, a challenge on your hands. Both of them have shown you that plenty of information or plenty of evidence and even recent guidelines saying this. At the end of the day, UKPDS is one study of 500 patients defending metformin. How can you convince the doubters? There are 30% doubters before the debate started. 30% did not believe metformin is the choice. Now you might even lose more. Can you protect this and increase? Um, I think my audience will, I will not lose them because, uh, because it's a re reality. Reality says that metformin is there. Metformin, we are using 60 years now, 60, six zero years. We are have a plenty of life, no need for studies. We have a plenty of real world life. The, the metformin is there like pyramids behind me. It's established, well established. Even the new drug are using metformin to be standard, to be more powerful. The, the sodium glucose transporter, I respect them. I, I use them, GLP-1, all of them, uh, the DBB-4, I use them very well. But they using metformin to have the evidence, the power to reduce the A1C. Most of them are combining, uh, the using as a friend to be reaching uh, to their target. Of course, metformin. But when we say we need to put uh, a, 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 a level to start with, usually make the step by step. Education in the past, we are convincing our patient, do education, do exercise and diet for two to three weeks and then come to us. This is obsolete now. From day zero, diabetic patient, type two patient, you must start with metformin plus the uh, education at the same level. We didn't say we not combined, we combine. I ask you to combine, but when? Start metformin first. Maybe after one to two months, you can use combination, but first metformin. Many of our patients come on metformin for years. Many of our pre-diabetic patients are kept away of diabetes because of metformin. Our patients, I think the best for him, even if he is insurance, the insurance is the money of our country. The insurance is, we are, we are asked about it. Metformin is the big choice, is the even choice, 
uh, most of the study, even the impact life flows in metformin, the study, as Dr. Sam mentioned, it is the difference is 1.8 and 2, um, the A1C reduction. So the difference is very marginal to use an expensive drug and the um, a drug which are cheap and uh, little side effects. Uh, the comparison of side effect and the cost is very bad, is very big between two. We have a little uh, experience, the, just a few years about uh, sodium glucose and GLP-1. A few years, we are working 10 years maybe, but we are against, we have 60 years. Okay, thank you, Khaled. I think well, I convinced you, Dr. Mohammed. Well, it's not me <laughs> you need to convince, it's the audience who will do the voting. Okay, of course, it's I'm a very nice. I'm to do voting. Very I just nice need game. to play the devil advocates. Um, yes. I will go through some of the questions. Some of the questions is related to the debate and some of it is not really related to debate. So going back to you, Harid, again, one, is, one person is saying, um, lately we've heard about metformin and risk of gastric cancer. Is it true? Quick uh, answer, yes or no? No, no, you, it, it, it's, uh, it's, an anti -cancer, it's an anti-cancer drug, according to the my slide. Metformin <laughs> is one of the important drugs that has been uh, quoted in a number of cancers. Yes. Ibtisam, I would like to get back to you again. Thank you for highlighting the earliest guidelines. I have deliberately put the case at the level of eight so that we can see of the potentials of one or more than one drug. <clears throat> um, so because if it's clear cut, then there is no debate. But aren't you concerned? I know you are very keen on patient education. Aren't you concerned that dual therapy and triple therapy will make the patient, wow, I went to this fantastic doctor and she gave me uh, this, this uh, prescription. My control now is perfect. I don't need to do or change anything. And then three years on the line, perhaps three years, or perhaps longer or shorter, this patient is stuck. They will need to start on insulin because they have never changed their lifestyle because the doctor fixed the problem for the first two or three years. And then later, they're stuck with injections and insulin. Are you concerned about that approach? And maybe I can explain a, bit, a touch more. The studies that we show about the difference in compliance and in, isn't this, we are punishing the patient because of the laziness of the doctors in these studies not intensifying treatment on time? Or is it that this is the reality and we need to take over from, from the patient? Uh, actually, the question has uh, many parts. Uh, I will start first of all with the education. Uh, I hope I am not misunderstood by the dual and triple therapy. Dual and triple therapy does not mean we ignore the education. Education is the cornerstone for any people with diabetes, even on insulin. We have to, uh, I always insist and ensure that uh, following diet and lifestyle is important for the drug as well, because if they don't follow this, then the drug will be useless. So again, it's important whether the patient is on monotherapy, triple therapy, insulin, they should follow the uh, uh, regular, uh, the uh, education and the glucose monitoring, the diet compliance and changing the lifestyle. Um, the second part of the question is, I forgot, <laughs> the second part of the question. The, 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 the second part was related to that this approach is punishing the patient because of the evidence from the difference of the inertia of the doctors. Uh, so yes. I am as a patient, I'm, I have to pay for the inertia of doctors where perhaps if my doctor is as good as you, they will step in on, on time. and. Yes. Me yes, actually, I have shown the evidence. Actually, there are more evidence, but I showed you the evidence for people who are newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes as compared both, both the groups are newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And they compared those newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes on dual therapy versus those on stepwise uh, approach. And, and I have shown you the difference. Both groups are newly diagnosed. It's not like uh, these people are uh, being on uh, like poor control for some time and uh, there is delay of initiation of therapy. So they are all groups, all studies they have shown on people who are drug naive, newly diagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes. Thank you, Prisam. Guys, carry on sending your questions. I'm going through them. One of the questions is for you, Ines. You have your hat of nutrition and someone is saying, what about low, ca low calorie, low fat diet? Wouldn't that work in this particular case? Why do we rush with a drug 
and we it's only been six months of diabetes, perhaps we can push again for prescribing a specific type of diet. Yes, of course, diet is a cornerstone for the treatment of uh, diabetes. But the, uh, the real problem with that is uh, the level of motivation, uh, not only of um, patient, but also of uh, doctor. So doctor should have time and um, also knowledge to, uh, to prescribe and follow such diet. And the uh, patient also should uh, be motivated to follow it. In the case presented here, you said that uh, during six months, he uh, has difficulty to sustain uh, diet. So this is the real problem. When we uh, associate uh, with uh, um, a nutritional uh, management uh, uh, drug like metformin or other uh, type of drug, uh, we can um, indirectly motivate patient when he will see that uh, his A1C uh, is uh, going down and his weight also, he can um, uh, lose weight. This can motivate him to a sustain a diet. It's not the contrary. He will be more motivated to, uh, to, um, to have better uh, habits. And then we are also able to um, decrease the doses of those treatment. This is also possible. Uh, uh, of course, uh, he should uh, follow, continue to follow uh, diet or low carb or even uh, uh, a well-balanced um, uh, diet advices. Okay, so let's agree on some of the points that you all agreed upon. You're all keen on getting the patient well controlled. You're all saying about patient individualization and looking into what should happen. Two of you agree of metformin being one of the drugs, either on its own or in combination. In as because this was a debate and you were not given the choice of this, you're simply saying you can also use other drugs. You did say in your presentation, perhaps if there is specific indications such as weight reduction or if the patient is not tolerating metformin. Khalid, I would like to come back to you one of the questions is related to other adverse effects of metformin regarding cardiovascular. Is it harmful for the heart? Or certain cardiac condition, we should avoid metformin? Of course. Um, uh, the metformin is very safe for heart. The, met the metformin uh, can be given to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and uh, even to uh, first classes of uh, heart failure. But when we reach to uh, third degree or fourth degree, uh, fourth grade uh, classification of heart failure, we must stop the metformin. Even um, in advanced stage of heart, the insulin is the best. Uh, plus or minus adding the cardiovascular uh, uh, sodium glucose transporter uh, will be the choice for him. Um, uh, the metformin um, show a, a good cardiovascular benefit. This usually missed um, uh, in the UKBDS study. The cardiovascular benefit of metformin are there. I show you uh, maybe a lot of uh, studies, but not are familiar to all of us, that uh, cardiovascular uh, benefit of metformin are there. So um, when you use metformin, it's very safe drug. But I ask all the cardiologists all over the world to stop the metformin. When you ask your patient to go to the coronary theater, just uh, one day or two days before the, the injection, before the contrast dye, um, or even before any uh, major operation. This, this is the only link that I usually uh, ask my colleague in cardiology and the vascular surgeon. When you go to the theater to do a, an, um, an coronary angio or peripheral arterial angio, you stop the metformin 40 or, two, uh, or 24 hours just before and maybe 48 hours uh, after uh, the finish of the dye uh, and the clearance from our body. Thank you very much. Let me tell you, uh, the three of you, that the audience love the presentation. They want the video to be on demand and some of them want the slides as well. So okay, agree. It, it's, it's working well. Now, carrying on with the question. So, if this one of the questions are saying is, if you start with a combination and then your patient as one of the attendees is saying, my patient now HB1C is 5.5. Should I carry on or uh, should I start stopping the medication or reducing the medication? Now, getting 
well below the 6.5, 5.5, well within the target. You still carry on with dual or triple or even monotherapy for the sake of the argument, or what would you do? Actually, this is a marvelous effect of the multiple uh, or dual or triple therapy. So this is uh, showing it's, uh, it's paying its uh, benefit. So if a patient is on drugs that does not result in side effect like hypoglycemia, then probably will continue because if we uh, stop one of those drugs, then we'd expect that the control will not be as good. So if there is no side effect from the drug, I would continue. And if the patient does not have any concern of those dual or triple drugs, then I will continue uh, hoping that the patient will maintain this. And I have shown you that the, the effect of early control is not only A1C reduction, but also durability. This is a legacy effect. It will last with him for like four or five years. So we want to I maintain this legacy you, effect. The, the person in the case was only using citagliptin um, or DP4 inhibitor. So it, it, let's take it from a philosoph philosophical point of view, similar to what the recommendations for insulin is start insulin if the patient is toxic, hyperglycemia got better, then the advice is perhaps we can stop the insulin. Because the insulin is insulin, we know the advantage of stopping it. Do you think the same would apply if the patient is on monotherapy or on dual therapy to now the patient is on perfect control? the legacy effect or give them a chance of enhancing their lifestyle and start fresh again? Again, it will depend on the treatment. If the patient is on insulin therapy, you know insulin therapy when uh, the A1C got, gets near to uh, target or uh, around the target, then the risk of hypoglycemia is there. But if we are using something like metformin, for example, or DDB4 inhibitor, then there is no much risk and we have the added benefit of those drugs. So I don't think we should stop those drugs if the patient does not have any intolerance or any side effect. We should continue with them for their added benefit. So I, I don't see any point of stopping it. Like, uh, I mean, this is not toxicity. It's like toxicity is uh, what we're talking about A1C of above nine or above 10 with blood glucose of more than 300. Our patient is only eight. So I wouldn't rather uh, I wouldn't rather stop if there is not any concern about the drug side effect, and if we if we are concerned about cost, then this is the issue. The cost then we may combine drugs like metformin, cheaper drugs like uh, regular metformin with sulfonylurea, and here probably maybe if we uh, combine sulfonylurea with metformin, and the patient A1C is like five, then we should watch for hypoglycemia. If hypoglycemia is there, then we should reduce the drug uh, of sulfonylurea or replace it with another drug. But uh, as a whole, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop if the patient is uh, on target. Stay on, Inette. It's a question for you of combination of combining long-acting insulin with uh, oral hypoglycemic drugs, specifically if the HP1C is above 9. Um, give us your hands-on clinical practice. What would you do and for how long? And um, so for the benefits of the attendees. So we, if we consider our patient is newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes and his, uh, I'll just uh, give all the scenario. If our patient is like A1C is 7 or 7.5, probably I would start only, nine. probably with metformin. Above 9. But, and but if, it, yeah, if, above. if it is above 9, then I would start uh, above 9 or 10, I would start insulin with metformin probably plus minus uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGL-2 for the sake of the also weight to neutralize the weight gain. So if, if the patient is um, controlled, then probably I would uh, stop the insulin. Probably I would stop the insulin, continue with other combination therapy like metformin with the SGL-2 inhibitor or with the DDB4 inhibitor. Yes, uh, if he passes the stage of the glucose toxicity. So there is no, it is not necessarily, if we give it only for glucose toxicity and patient improved, then probably we may stop the insulin and continue with other dual therapy, like uh, uh, formin and DDB4 inhibitor. Okay. Uh, if, Ines, I'll come to you uh, on a couple of questions. The first one is combination with vildagliptin or citagliptin. Is there a specific evidence to show a preference of one DP4 inhibitor com compared to the other? Uh, in monotherapy or in a combination? Combination. So the, the, the question is, would you combine metformin with vildagliptin or citagliptin? And is there any evidence for this? Uh, both of treatment are, uh, have a, a good efficacy. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, we ha it will depend on the availability because in some countries, one treatment is available, another no. This is uh, first of all. Um, 
my experience uh, is that I, I am using more vendagliptin than citagliptin, and I have uh, a very good um, uh, results. And with this combination, I am able to decrease uh, the treatment, the dose of treatment when uh, my patient achieve uh, a good um, result in A1C. And I can um, let him on uh, monotherapy, uh, vidagliptin, example, no metformin. And we, I can uh, sustain a good uh, um, uh, balanced uh, glycemia, glycemia in this patient. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a good option to, uh, to, uh, to offer to our uh, patients effectively. Yes. Okay. Pilot, a question about metformin and losing weight. Can we use metformin for losing weight? Uh, the metformin uh, is a very good drug as a weight neutral drug. It's a weight neutral drug, not classified as a weight losing drug. Even in the last few years, they put it in the guideline uh, dash uh, weight losing drug. They lose about one to two kilograms in average of the patient at the early start because of the G uh, GIT side effect. The GIT side effect, some sort of gastritis help us to uh, have some sort of um, uh, little eating, so uh, make them lose weight. But they are not directly a weight losing drug. When we are seeking for a drug that losing weight, we must search for sodium glucose transporter or uh, GLP-1. Okay, there's a number of questions from the, the, the guys agreeing with some of the points, giving their own case scenarios. Of course, in many cases, um, some are agreeing with you, Khaled, some agreeing with the combination therapy. Uh, this is the reality of life, not all the patients are the same. One of the attendees is so convinced about, or asking us about our thoughts on Ibisartan to prevent or to improve glycemic control. So herbs, angiotensin 2 antagonists in general, uh, do you think that this is an important for, um, pharmaco um, effective measure for prevention of diabetes or improving glycemic control for your patients, or it's mostly a uh, marginal effect from research studies? Any of you, whoever wish to answer this. Um, of course, we have a little evidence. This is very, very little evidence to, to keep it uh, as I mentioned. Uh, we're, waiting, um, we're waiting more reality, we're waiting more studies uh, but we cannot push it as, a, as an anti-hyperglycemic drug or, or even uh, as a, a drug that aid uh, our uh, diabetes patients. Of course not. I think I'm quite happy with the discussion. Do any Do of you not recommend wish, this? wish to ask the other person extra questions, not to debate anymore. We think we've, um, anyone, everyone have debated, but to mention some of the important points for our attendees and including uh, Professor Jamal, if you wish to uh, get into the, the discussion and the debate, you're welcome, of course, uh, to give us your clinical input. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'm, maybe just I'll add just only a little bit because I have seen some of the question when to start uh, dual therapy at what A1C. So okay. I just want to summarize, rather than um, talking about A1C, let us talk about uh, target A1C decline rather than A1C, because uh, A1C depends on our target. So if our target, like in this patient, is 6.5, is different than a patient with the target A1C of 7.5, and his starting A1C is 8. So if, uh, according to the recommendation, if your target decline A1C is between 1.5 to 2%, then probably we should start with dual therapy rather than monotherapy. If it is more than that, then probably I would suggest, although this is not clearly mentioned in the guidelines to start with trivial therapy. And I'm sure the guidelines probably did not show this very clearly, but I'm sure that the guidelines are going to change. And because now we have more evidence and I have shown you recently two new studies uh, on the dual and trivial therapy. So I hope that the guidelines is going to support this in the future. One of the colleagues from Riyadh today was tweeting that the new recommendations are uh, perhaps influenced by the authors who are heavy pharma industry supporters. How much do you think this is the case and how much do you think this is um, the evidence? Any of you? No, I think the, the right will be right. Metformin uh, 
despite uh, a little country or little uh, companies uh, put it in, uh, in, in, in their agenda uh, as a study or the research uh, now because it's established well. So metformin defend itself, even in 21, metformin is still there, the first line of treatment. Metformin may be waiting 2020. Uh, so I think, I think um, uh, the name, the study, the glyphlosin and the, and the G line because they have a good evidence. Uh, I didn't think the company cannot able just promotion, maybe promotion or something that, that they can push the media, but they can, they difficult to, to put the guideline, their Any name in the guideline, except they have established evidence. Yeah, well, I'm not too sure about this, Khaled. I, I see lots of different guidelines and some of them are, it looks like some, one person can see the glass is half full, the other person see the glass is half empty. So, and we, we have very little head-to-head -head comparisons. It's usually um, one drug yes. on, mm. and we, we don't have a lot, we don't even have a study on many studies on triple therapy or quadruple therapy. A small number of studies yes. that <laughs> come to- uh, Small number. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Ines, you look like you're itching to say something. Yes, I, I would like to say that uh, um, uh, we, we lack of study, uh, study uh, that uh, are comparing head-to-head uh, -head monotherapy versus metformin. Uh, the most of uh, studies are comparing monotherapy uh, other than metformin uh, versus placebo. So to, to have, um, uh, I think, um, good uh, um, I mean, results and uh, uh, data, we should compare on long time head-to-head -head monotherapy versus metformin. Uh, perhaps uh, in next years, it will change because we have new uh, drugs uh, that are discovered uh, uh, recently. And perhaps in uh, 50 years, it will be changed. It will not be the same that metformin will uh, um, be maintained as the first uh, um, drug, uh, first line uh, therapy. Uh, perhaps uh, the, the only thing is cost that uh, uh, remain at uh, it, that place. But we will discover other uh, effects, uh, perhaps better than uh, metformin in the future. Thank you, Ines. Uh, uh, Sam, anything you want to add? Or you I think I'm just supporting what they have been said. Still, we lack uh, a lot of evidence, but the guidelines, what is the, there in the guidelines is based on whatever evidence we have. So that's why we see the, with the growth of the cardiovascular outcome trial, we have seen the uh, frequent changes of the latest guidelines based on the cardiovascular evidence. But in regards to monotherapy versus dual or triple therapy, the data is limited. So we want more uh, studies to have uh, more impact and more clear recommendations and guidelines on when to start and how to start and when to stop. Even in regards to the question of the insulin for glucose toxicity, we don't have a clear guidelines uh, when to stop the uh, insulin for glucose toxicity, but this is based on our personal experience and yeah. uh, what we see here. So there is still, there are some, I would say some gaps in the guidelines that needs to be addressed in order because those guidelines, um, really um, it's important and helpful for people like in primary health care and people who want something clear for them to know when to start, how to start, what to start and when to stop. So I think we have still gaps in some of the guidelines, yes. We had 77 questions, that's, that's a, a record. Well done, it looks like even though we're talking about treatment initiation in, in a simple case of type two, it's causing a lot of discussion and a lot of debate. I have deliberately did not answer the, the questions that are not related to the topic of today. We promise you in future IDF webinars, we'll try to address some of these topics related to the kidney and diabetes or even intermittent fasting. Uh, lots of thoughts and ideas are coming from you guys and we will take stock from these ideas. Let me now share the slide again of the voting. We'd like you as attendees to vote again let me put the case again. Uh, just hold on for the for the poll. Let me just share my slides first. So for those of you who maybe started late, 
this was the case, a 44 years old male with type two diabetes it, with insurance diagnosed six months ago, um, HP1C was 8.2, became eight, unable to push more with lifestyle measures, BMI is 28, other parameters are known. The questions you have is start metformin, start with another met with drug, not metformin, or start with combination therapy. The combination could be dual therapy, triple therapy, it is up to you. Please answer your questions now and vote all of you now. I want to see over 600 votes, please. So while people are voting, let me ask our panelists. So start with Ines, you had 4%. Do you think you've increased your market share? Yes, I think I will gain more votes, yes. <laughs> and Khaled, do you think you gained more or lost more or remained at 70%? I, I, I think it will, uh, will, will, will slight increase. Slight increase. Yeah. And yourself, Ipti Sam? I think I will get most of the voices. <laughs> get most of the voices. Okay. So show us the results, please. This is exciting. Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, still, yeah. how much? Yes, Sam, you've won. You're 51%. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> if, if, unless you remain at 4%, yes, I, don't I told you, don't be uh, overconfident with <laughs> the confidence. approach. It's, a, it's reality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't lose any, any voice. It's a good <laughs> result. <laughs> good result. <laughs> in, in fact, we had 300 people voted. It's more or less similar to what the number who voted initially, so it's a good representation. I personally love that debate. It shows that um, we need the sort of discussion and um, changing the atmosphere of didactic lectures. At the end of the day, what you three have shown us is important to look into the individual case scenarios. Uh, this does not mean that the debate is saying we should use combination yes. therapy for all our patients. The debate is related to the case that we want. Dr. Tissam have clearly said in her presentation, our target for this case is below 6.5. That's a young person in his early 40s. And uh, Dr. Khaled defended the case of the metformin. I gave a difficult task to Dr. Ines Salim from uh, Tunis that in the debate, well I wanted her to choose another option, which is quite difficult in considering the case. Thank you all for your Thank very, you. very, Thank very, very well-debated case and presentation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, final points from you. Thank you, for, thank you, dear Hassanin. Thank you for all speakers. It was a very, very nice webinar and very, very interesting uh, debate uh, how to use uh, medication, why to use uh, them. And um, I, I think uh, next webinar will be uh, also very interesting because uh, uh, all speakers and our speakers in MENA region and our moderator uh, plan to uh, give uh, the, the, the best thing for their experience uh, in different countries. Thank you for thank you. Uh, all. And uh, I, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors again, thank our organizers, Amber, and certainly thanks our attendees staying on a Friday evening. We had uh, almost uh, 700 people um, staying throughout the debate uh, without a much of reduction in the numbers. So this is a, a very, very good assessment. Thank you all. And please um, um, uh, follow the link with Amber. The video of, the, of this webinar will be available in a few weeks time on the website and you should all have access to it. Keep in tune. Next week, we have another very important IDF um, discussion webinar, just one week from today. 
It's related to blood glucose monitoring, and you will have very interesting discussion. Uh, you will receive the information by, via email with a program. Um, I don't have very, very powerful speakers as well. We have Professor Oliver Schnell, we have um, 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 Dr. Ghafoor from Pakistan, and Dr. Ala uh, Bashir from, from uh, Dubai and Sudan uh, will cover an interesting point about inpatients' um, use of CGMs and flash glucose monitoring, and uh, it, very, very interesting debate. Thank you all for attending, Thank and look you. forward to see you next week in the wow. following IDF webinar um, as we have been having for some time. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.